we have a beautiful nature around us isn't it what do you observe around us we have buildings plants and trees which bear fruits and flowers animals insects and we human beings water gases etc etc among all these which has mass and occupies space is matter matter can be divided further if we subdivide matter that would ultimately yield us atoms which cannot be divided further so atoms are the fundamental units of matter which cannot be divided further later on at the end of 19th century experimental evidences told that atoms consist of subatomic particles that is proton neutron and electrons what are these subatomic particles and how these subatomic particles were discovered and where these subatomic particles are present in an atom this is vidyashri from vivid pu academy in this video we will discuss about the discovery of subatomic particles and how these subatomic particles are arranged inside an atom the subatomic particle electron was discovered by the cathode ray discharge tube experiment and the cathode ray tube is made up of a glass tube which has metal electrodes on either ends which is sealed inside that and one of the electrode is cathode and the other is anode cathode is a negatively charged electrode and anode is positively charged electrode the glass tube was filled with inert gases like nitrogen or hydrogen the electric discharge was observed at low pressure of the gases and at high applied voltages during this electric discharge electricity would flow by the stream of particles traveling from cathode to the anode these stream of particles that move from negative electrode that is cathode to the positive electrode that is anode is the cathode rays these cathode rays were invisible to the naked eyes and were identified by coating the glass tube behind anode with zinc sulfide this zinc sulfide coating acts as a fluorescent material so that the spots will be formed when the cathode rays travel from cathode to the anode these spots indicate that the particles were moving from cathode to the anode from this experiment it was concluded that cathode rays travel from cathode to the anode in the absence of the electric as well as the magnetic field these rays travel in straight line we have studied that like charges attract each other and unlike charges repel each other based on this we can tell that since these cathode rays are traveling from the negative cathode to the positive anode we can tell that these cathode rays consist of negatively charged particles hence they are named as electrons also the properties of cathode rays were not dependent on the gas that is taken inside the glass tube later on j j thompson studied the deflection of cathode rays in the presence of electric and magnetic field as well as in the absence of electric and magnetic field from this he found out the charge to mass ratio of the electron and that came out to be 1.75 into 10 to the power 11 coulomb per kg he also observed that the deflection was dependent on three factors the first factor is that as you increase the magnetic and electric field the deflection was also increasing as lighter is the particle heavier was the deflection and when the magnitude of the charge increases the deflection was also increased from millikan's oil drop experiment it was found out that the charge of electron was minus 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb so using the charge to mass ratio which was found by jj thompson as well as 
the charge of electron which was found by Millikan, we can calculate mass of electron and after calculating that the value for mass of electron is given out to be 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg. The discovery of subatomic particle proton was done by Goldstein and he used modified cathode ray tube experiment for the discovery of protons. During the experiment, it was observed that the rays traveled from anode to the cathode and these rays were termed as canal rays. As these rays deviated towards the negative side of electric and magnetic field, it was considered that these rays consist of positively charged particles uh, called as protons. Unlike the cathode rays, these canal rays properties were dependent on the gas that is filled in the glass tube of the cathode ray and it was found that the charge to mass ratio was found to vary with the gases that is used in the tube. Later on, neutrons were discovered by Chadwick by bombarding a thin sheet of beryllium metal with alpha particles. The subatomic particle neutron was neutral and it has no charge. The subatomic particle electron is represented by the symbol E. It has an absolute charge of minus 1.602176 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. Relative charge is written as minus 1. Electron has a mass 9.109382 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg. In terms of unified mass, it is 0 0.00054 and the approximate mass for electron is 0. The subatomic particle proton is represented by the symbol P. The absolute charge for a proton is plus 1.602176 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. Relative charge is plus 1. Mass of proton is 1.672616 into 10 to the power minus 27 kg. Mass of proton in terms of unified mass is 1.00727 and the approximate mass for proton is 1. Neutron is represented by symbol N. Neutron is not having any charge, therefore its absolute charge and relative charge is zero. Mass of neutron is 1.674927 into 10 to the power minus 27 kg. In terms of unified mass, mass of the neutron is 1.00867. The approximate mass for neutron is 1. After understanding about the discovery of the subatomic particles, now let us study how these subatomic particles are arranged in an atom. Many scientists have performed experiments in order to study the arrangement of these subatomic particles inside an atom and all their experimental observations has been concluded and they have proposed various models for the structure of atom. So the first scientist who contributed in this field is J.J. Thompson. In the year 1898, he proposed the plum pudding model for atoms. According to J.J. Thompson, atom is spherical in shape with the radius of 10 to the power minus 10 meter and protons are uniformly distributed whereas electrons are embedded within them. If you want to visualize this model, you can consider a watermelon where the reddish part of the watermelon is considered as that protons which are present in the atom whereas the black color seeds of the watermelon can be visualized as electrons which are embedded in the protons. Atom as a whole has uniformly distributed mass and the number of protons as well as number of electrons are found to be equal which tells that atom as a whole is electrically neutral. Thomson's model can also be visualized as a plum pudding or resin pudding. Hence the name we have is 
as watermelon model, plum pudding model and ricin pudding model. We all know that electrons are capable to move freely whereas according to Thomson's model the electrons are embedded within the protons. So the biggest limitation of Thomson's model was that he considered electrons are fixed to a particular place whereas those electrons are capable of moving freely. Rutherford's experimental studies led to the proposal of nuclear model of atom. In his alpha particle scattering experiment, Rutherford used a thin gold foil and he bombarded alpha particles from a radioactive source into the gold foil. This gold foil was surrounded by circular zinc sulfide screen around it. Whenever this alpha particle which have the penetrating power passed through the gold foil, there were spots made on the zinc sulfide screen. According to Thomson's model of atom, mass is uniformly distributed in an atom. Therefore, the alpha particle which has high penetration power when it passed through the gold foil, the velocity of alpha particles should slow down. But the results of alpha ray scattering experiment was so unexpected that they observed most of the alpha particles directly passed through the gold foil and they hit the zinc sulfide screen. Only a few alpha ray particles scattered with some angle and 1 of 20,000 alpha particles deflected back at 180 degree. So what can be concluded from these experimental observations is that since most of the alpha particles directly passed through the gold foil, we can tell that most of the space inside an atom is empty. And secondly, since the alpha particles has deflected, we can tell that these alpha particles which are positive in nature and something inside the nucleus which is positive in nature both are repelling one another and therefore this deflection has been occurred. It means that the positively charged particles that is the protons are concentrated on a small region in the center of the atom that causes the deflection of alpha particles. Rutherford also calculated the volume occupied by the nucleus and he found that it was very much small compared to that of the volume of the atom and he found the radius of the nucleus was about 10 to the power minus 15 meter whereas the radius of the atom was 10 to the power minus 10 meter. If we want to visualize about the size of atom as well as nucleus, we can imagine a cricket ball at the center of the stadium and 5 km would be the radius of the particular atom. According to Rutherford's nuclear model of atom, it can be told that atom has a positively charged region at its center which is densely bound at the center and this small region where positively charged particles are concentrated is called as nucleus of the atom. This nucleus of atom is surrounded by electrons which are revolving around the nucleus in the circular orbits. This model of atom can be visualized as similar to our solar system where sun at the central part of solar system can be considered as nucleus of an atom and the planets which are revolving around the sun are identical to that of the electrons which are revolving around the nucleus. So, we know protons are present in the nucleus of the atom and therefore nucleus is positively charged. Also we know that the charge on proton is nothing but it is opposite charge that is present on the electron. The total number of protons as well as the total number of electrons present in an atom are equal and this is so because atom as a whole is electrically neutral. Now the number of protons which are present in an atom is termed as the atomic number. Say for example, the number of protons present in hydrogen atom is 1 and therefore atomic number of hydrogen is 1. Consider sodium which has 11 protons in the nucleus and therefore its atomic number is 11. And so as mentioned 
Atomic number is nothing but it is equal to the number of protons present in an atom which is in turn equal to the number of electrons in an neutral atom. Along with protons, nucleus also contains neutrons. So neutrons as well as protons together they are termed as nucleons. The number of nucleons will give us mass number of an atom. An atom can be represented by the normal element symbol say consider it as x then atomic number is represented as z and the mass number is represented as a. So to the symbol x the atomic number is mentioned as superscript on the left hand side and mass number is represented as subscript on the left hand side. For example carbon atom with its atomic number 6 and mass number 12 can be written as 6C12 and nitrogen with the atomic number 7 and mass number 14 can be written as 7N14. Certain atoms have identical atomic number but they differ in their mass number. They are known as isotopes. For example, you can consider carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14 where the atomic number for all these carbon atom is 6 whereas their mass number is different that is 12, 13 and 14 respectively. Similarly, we find certain atoms which has same mass number but they differ in their atomic number. They are known as isobars. For example, carbon 14 as well as nitrogen 14. Here the mass number is 14 for both carbon as well as nitrogen where the atomic number for carbon is 6 and for nitrogen it is 7. Now I will tell you how to solve any questions related to the atomic number as well as mass number for an atom. The question is calculate the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in 35 Br80. They have given you atom in the element symbol 35 Br80 whereas if I write the general expression we have Zxa. So from this I can write atomic number is 35 and mass number is 80. So for a neutral atom we have atomic number is equal to the number of protons. This is true in whatever the case of an atom whether it is neutral or not and this number of protons is equal to the number of electrons for neutral atom and therefore the number of protons as well as number of electrons are equal and this is equal to 35. So we have found out the number of protons as well as number of electrons. Now in order to find the number of neutrons, we know mass number is nothing but it is sum of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So in order to find number of neutrons, we will just rearrange this expression. The mass number that is represented by A and the number of protons is nothing but it is the atomic number represented by Z. So when I subtract atomic number from the mass number 80, we are going to get the number of neutrons and that is equal to 45. Always remember that the number of protons is equal to number of neutrons only in case of neutral atom. For example, if I consider bromine with a negative charge. So here number of protons is nothing but it is equal to 35 whereas the number of electrons is 35 plus 1 which is equal to 36. This plus 1 is because of this negative charge. Negative charge on bromine indicates that it has one electron 
excess than that of the neutral bromine atom. So we have number of protons 35 which is less than the number of electrons. According to Rutherford's nuclear model of atom, the positively charged particles are concentrated to the center of atom which is termed as nucleus and the model told us that electrons revolve around the nucleus in the circular orbits. Whereas, if any object is revolving in a circular path, there is acceleration that is produced and electron is a charged particle. Whenever a charged particle is rotating in a circular orbit, it is expected to emit radiations and the atomic orbits should shrink. Whereas, this leads to the instability of the atom. But atoms are very much stable. Hence, Rutherford's model could not give an account for the stability of the atoms. This is one of the biggest drawbacks of Rutherford's nuclear model of atom. Secondly, Rutherford's nuclear model of atom could not clearly explain how the electrons are arranged around the nucleus in the circular orbits and it did not give any information about the energy of the electron. In other words, I can tell that Rutherford's nuclear model of atom does not give any information related to the electronic structure of the atom. These drawbacks of Rutherford's nuclear model of atom made scientists to think for some other models which would effectively explain the structure of atom. The study of interaction of electromagnetic radiations with matter provided information related to the structure of atoms and the scientist by name Niels Bohr used these informations to make improvements to the Rutherford's nuclear model of atom and he proposed his model that there are two important development that led to the Bohr's model of atom. First is the dual nature of radiation and the second is atomic spectra as well as quantization of energy levels. What is the meaning of dual nature of radiation? What is atomic spectra? You have studied what are waves in your class 9, right? Wave is a disturbance that is produced in a medium and it propagates through space with transference of energy. What are electromagnetic radiations? These electromagnetic radiations are waves which are produced by the electric and magnetic field. We have atoms. These atoms consist of electrons and protons which are charged particles. When these charged particles oscillate or vibrate, they produce acceleration. Accelerated charged particles produces electric field. These electric fields keeps on changing and the changing electric field produces a magnetic field. These electric and magnetic field, they propagate through space in the form of waves and this is how electromagnetic radiations are produced. The important properties of these electromagnetic radiations are the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to one another and these two electric and magnetic field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation of wave. You can visualize the propagation of electromagnetic radiation in the screen. As you can see, the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to one another and both are perpendicular to the direction of propagation. These electromagnetic radiations, they do not require any material medium for their propagation. They can travel through space. For example, if you consider sound waves, we know sound waves require material medium for their propagation. Whereas, these electromagnetic radiations can propagate without any medium. There are various parameters which define these waves that is its amplitude, frequency, wavelength, time period, velocity. Let us discuss these parameters one by one in detail. As you can see, here I have considered a wave. The upper part here in the positive y direction, this is crest of a wave and the lower part is known as the trough. There are different parameters that defines a wave and these parameters are 
wavelength amplitude frequency velocity time period and wave number now let us see what are these parameters one by one wavelength wavelength is the distance between successive crests or troughs so here in this particular wave diagram which i have considered i have two crests here so the distance between these crests this represents wavelength so wavelength is represented by symbol lambda it is nothing but the distance between successive crests or the troughs and the si unit of wavelength is meter there are other units which represents the shorter wavelength it can be nanometer or angstrom so we have 1 nanometer is 10 to the power minus 9 meter 1 angstrom is 10 to the power minus 10 meter the second parameter that defines a wave is frequency frequency is nothing but it is the number of oscillations per unit time it is represented by the symbol nu and the si unit of frequency is per second in order to honor the scientist hertz who has invented this term it is represented as hertz amplitude is the distance between the mean position and any of the extreme positions it is represented by a so this is the mean position this is an extreme position so this the direction of wave along x axis is mean position and this is the extreme position so the distance between the mean position and the extreme position in any directions gives us amplitude the si unit of amplitude is meter wave velocity is represented by v it is the distance traveled by a wave per unit time and the si unit of wave velocity is meter per second speed or velocity is given by the formula distance upon time for a wave speed is denoted by v and the distance with respect to wave is nothing but its wavelength divided by time and the relationship between speed wavelength and frequency is v is equal to wavelength is lambda divided by its time period is t also we have another relation between time period and the frequency as 1 by nu so we can write this as lambda into nu velocity is the product of wavelength and frequency time period for a wave is the time taken to move through one complete oscillation wave number denoted by nu bar it represents the number of wavelengths per unit distance so nu bar is the reciprocal of wavelength hence the si unit for wave number is per meter so wave can be defined by all these parameters these formulas which relate wave number and wavelength as well as speed of a wave with its wavelength and frequency is important also you need to remember that light 
travels with same speed in vacuum and that speed is constant it is represented by c which has a value of 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second c is velocity of light in vacuum it is constant given by 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second let us discuss a few questions on how to find the frequency or wavelength for a particular radiation of electromagnetic spectrum. The question is, the Vivid Bharati station of All India Radio Delhi broadcasts on a frequency of 1368 kHz. Calculate the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation emitted by transmitter. Which part of the electromagnetic spectrum does it belong to? From the question, we can write the frequency of radiation represented by nu is equal to 1368 kHz. We know that the SI unit of frequency is Hertz. So, let us convert this kilo Hertz means it is 10 to the power 3 Hertz. So, converting it. 1368 into 10 to the power 3 hertz or the unit is per second so this is 10 to the power 3 per second they have asked us to identify which part of the electromagnetic spectrum does it belong after calculating wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation so, in order to find wavelength, we have the formula lambda is equal to C divided by nu, where C is speed of light in vacuum and it is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Now, let us substitute the value C is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Frequency of the radiation is 1368 into 10 to the power 3 hertz or Per second, this unit cancels, and after simplifying the remaining terms in the numerator and denominator, we get wavelength as 219.3 meter. And radiation of this wavelength that corresponds to the radio wave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Second question. The wavelength range of the visible spectrum extends from violet to red. Wavelength is given 400 nanometer to 750 nanometer. Express these wavelengths in frequencies. In terms of hertz, they have also given 1 nanometer is 10 to the power minus 19 meter. So, I can write wavelength for violet light is 400 nanometer which is equal to 400 into 10 to the power minus 9 meter and the wavelength for red light is given it is 750 nanometer which is equal to 750 into 10 to the power minus 9 meter we need to express these wavelengths in terms of frequencies so, first let us examine what is the frequency for violet light. Let us find it out first. Frequency of violet light. It is calculated by using the formula mu is equal to C by lambda. We know C has a value 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Substituting. C is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second divided by wavelength for violet light that is 400 into 10 to the power minus 9 meter. Upon simplification we get 7.5 into 10 to the power 14 hertz. So this is the frequency corresponding to violet light of the wavelength 400 nanometer. Let us calculate the frequency of red light 
in the similar way. So we have frequency is c by lambda, which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 divided by wavelength of red light that is 750 into 10 to the power minus 9 meter. Upon simplification, we get 4.0 into 10 to the power 14 hertz. So I can write the visible spectrum ranges from seven point five into ten to the power fourteen hertz to four point zero into ten to the power fourteen hertz in terms of frequency. And this is how you can solve this particular problem. There are various types of electromagnetic radiations based on its wavelength or its frequency. We can arrange all the different types of electromagnetic radiation according to the increasing order of wavelength or decreasing order of frequency. It is termed as the electromagnetic spectrum. Different regions of the spectrum have different names based on its frequency as well as wavelength. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. Arrangement of different radiations in the increasing order of wavelength or decreasing order of their frequencies. When we arrange different radiations in the increasing order of wavelength, we start from gamma rays, then x-rays, ultraviolet light, visible light, IR radiations, microwave radiations, radio waves. If I want to write it in the increasing order of frequency, then we start from radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiations, visible light, ultraviolet radiations, x-rays and gamma rays. Around the 10 to the power 6 hertz, we have radio waves which are widely used for broadcasting. Radios which we use at our home, they work mainly by capturing the radio waves transmitted by the radio stations. Radio waves are mainly used for television as well as mobile communication. Around 10 to the power 10 hertz, we have microwave radiations which are mainly used in microwave ovens used for cooking purposes at home. These microwave radiations are emitted by galaxies as well as stars. So, astronomers use these radiations to understand the structure of nearby galaxies as well as stars. Also around 10 to the power 12 hertz frequencies, we have infrared radiations which are mainly used for heating purposes. These infrared radiations are also used in night vision devices as well as infrared remote controls. Around frequency of 10 to the power 16 hertz, we have ultraviolet radiations which is the major components of sun's radiations. Also around 10 to the power 18 hertz, we have x-rays which are used widely in many of the applications. Doctors uses x-ray machine to take an image of our bone or teeth. So if any fractures are there in our bone, we can identify it by x-rays. Also, you might have observed somewhere that the airport security personnel, they use these x-rays to check the bags at the security checkings. Similarly, we have gamma rays which has a frequency around 10 to the power 22 hertz, have wide application in the medical field. Gamma ray imaging is used to see what is happening inside our body. If any defects are there inside the body, can be identified using gamma ray imaging. A small portion of the spectrum here at 10 to the power 14 hertz is the only part of the spectrum that our eyes can see and this is termed as the visible light and here we have 
seven different colors which are arranged in the increasing order of wavelength or the decreasing order of frequency it ranges from violet to the red color this is the only part of the spectrum that our eyes can see whereas all the other type of radiations can be detected only using certain instruments light bulbs stars etc emit this visible radiations wave nature of electromagnetic radiation clearly explains the two phenomena that is the diffraction and interference whereas wave nature of electromagnetic radiation fails to explain the nature of the radiation that is emitted by a hot body it is nothing but it's called as black body radiation wave nature of radiation also fail to explain the ejection of electrons from the metal surface when a radiation is incident on it also it failed to explain about the heat capacities of solid it could not give any explanation related to the atomic spectra of hydrogen atom the phenomenon of black body radiation was explained by max planck in the year 1900 when solids are heated they emits radiation of wide range of wavelengths for example a iron rod which is heated initially it exhibits dull red color then it shows bright red color then it becomes orange and as the temperature increases it becomes white further if we increase the temperature that becomes blue so as the temperature increases the frequency of the radiation that is emitted will decrease if we consider an ideal body which emits all types of radiation and absorbs all type of radiation it is named as black body and the radiation that is emitted or given out by a black body is termed as black body radiation the intensity versus frequency curve for a black body it depends on the temperature and you can visualize the graph here on the screen from this curve for black body you can visualize that the intensity of radiation emitted it increases as the wavelength decreases and it reaches a maximum value at a point further the intensity of the radiation decreases as you decrease the wavelength from these observations planck concluded that atoms or molecule absorb or emit radiations only in discrete values of energy not in a continuous manner this packets of energy he termed them as quanta and the energy of quanta was given by the expression e is equal to h nu where e represents the energy of quanta h is planck's constant whose value is given as 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second nu is the frequency of the radiation according to max planck the energy of photon or the quanta is quantized for example if you consider money we have currency notes for rupees 10 rupees 20 rupees 50 rupees 100 rupees 200 rupees 500 whereas if i want to get a currency for rupees 150 it is not available so this is what we can call it as quantization of money we have only certain values of currency notes that is accepted whereas if i ask for a currency note of rupees 150 it is not available this concept you can relate it to the energy of quanta and all the energy values which are acceptable for a quanta should be the integral multiple of the value h nu in this way planck was successful in explaining the distribution of intensity of a black body radiation as a function of frequency or wavelength at different temperatures of the black body in the year 1887 hertz observed that electrons are ejected from the surface of metals like sodium potassium rubidium when certain radiation is incident on them the phenomenon of ejection of electron is known as photoelectric effect he observed that these electrons are ejected as soon as the light falls on the surface of the metal and he observed no time gap between the incident of radiation as well as the ejection of the electrons the number of electrons ejected 
depends on the intensity of the light radiation that is used in the experiment. Intensity means I refer to the brightness whereas energy or frequency tells the color of the radiation. For example, if I consider violet light which is capable of ejecting electron from a metal surface. Let me consider dim violet light as well as bright violet light. Both these lights, the dim violet and bright violet has same frequency and the dark violet light has higher intensity and dim violet light has lesser intensity. Each metal has a characteristic frequency below which photoelectrons will not be ejected or emitted and this particular frequency is constant for a metal and we term it as threshold frequency which is denoted by nu naught. At all the frequencies greater than the threshold frequency ejected electrons comes out and they gain kinetic energy and they move away from the metal surface. Kinetic energy of the photoelectrons that depends on the frequency of the light radiation that is employed. More is the frequency of the light radiation that is employed, more is the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons emitted. These experimental observations could not be explained by classical theory. It is because according to classical theory, the kinetic energy of the ejected electron, it purely depends on the intensity of the light. Whereas the experimental observations showed that kinetic energy of the ejected electron was purely dependent on the frequency. It was independent of the intensity of the light radiation that is used. A clear explanation of photoelectric theory was given in the year 1905 by Albert Einstein. Einstein told that when a photon of sufficient energy strikes an electron present in the atom of a metal, the energy of photon is transferred immediately to the electron and spontaneously the electron is ejected out of the metal surface. So the phenomenon of photoelectric effect is instantaneous. More is the energy of the photon, more will be the kinetic energy of the ejected electron. In other words, the kinetic energy of photoelectrons was dependent on the frequency of light radiation. There is certain minimum amount of energy that is required for the ejection of electrons from the metal surface. This minimum energy is termed as work function and that is represented by the mathematical expression H nu naught. And the incident photon also has an energy of H nu. The difference between these two energies will be converted as kinetic energy of the ejected electron. And therefore, we can tell that the total energy of the ejected electron is the sum of its work function as well as the kinetic energy. And therefore, the expression H nu is equal to H nu naught plus kinetic energy. As the intensity of the photon increases, the number of electrons which are ejected from the metal surface also increases. Therefore, the number of photoelectrons are directly related to the intensity of the radiation that is used. The phenomenon of photoelectric effect and black body radiation cannot be explained by wave nature of radiation. It can be explained only considering particle nature of radiation. Whereas the phenomenon of interference and diffraction are explained based on the wave nature of radiation. Now, this led to a great confusion whether to consider wave nature of radiation or to consider the particle nature of radiation. Finally, scientists concluded that electromagnetic radiations behaves both as a wave and as a particle. Therefore, electromagnetic radiation has a dual nature that is it behaves as a particle as well as as a wave. This is also called as wave particle duality of electromagnetic radiation. More information towards the development of atomic model was obtained from atomic spectrum. The word spectrum is not a new word for you. You have studied about the spectrum in your 9th and 10th standard, isn't it? So what is spectrum? A ray of white light passed through prism 
is spread out into a series of colored bands. This is what we call as spectrum. A beautiful example for spectrum is rainbow. Rainbow is a naturally occurring spectrum. When a ray of white light is passed through a prism, a wave with shorter wavelength, it bends more than the one with longer wavelength. The spectrum of white light ranges from violet to red. Violet is most bent and red is least bent. Violet merges into blue, blue merges into green and so on. Such a spectrum where there is no gap between the various colors is a continuous spectrum. So rainbow which is a natural spectrum is a continuous spectrum. Atoms or molecules in a similar way can give a spectrum. When electromagnetic radiation interacts with atoms and molecules, they absorb or give energy. When they absorb energy, they reach to a higher energy state. This higher energy state is very unstable for these atoms or molecules. So in order to become stable, they jump from higher energy level to ground state. During this change of state, they emit radiations. These radiations correspond to various regions of electromagnetic spectrum. These emitted or absorbed radiations, when it is recorded as a spectrum, we call it as atomic spectrum. So, the spectrum which is obtained by the emission or absorption of radiation by an atom is nothing but it is the atomic spectrum. When these radiation that is emitted is passed through a prism, we will get this particular spectrum. There are two types of atomic spectra. One is the absorption spectra and type 2 is emission spectra. The atoms, molecules or ions that have absorbed radiations are said to be excited. These excited atoms, they are not stable in the excited level. They return back to the original ground energy level. During their return from the excited state, they emit certain radiations. The spectrum of these emitted radiations is called as the emission spectrum. So, emission spectrum is the spectrum of radiation that is emitted by an atom that has absorbed energy. How emission spectrum of a sample can be produced? When an atom is heated, that atom will go to excited state and the excited state is not a stable state for an atom. In order to achieve stability, that atom emits some radiation. So these emitted radiations are made to pass through a prism and it is recorded using a photographic film or a detector. The spectrum obtained will have colored lines against dark background. The emitted lines will be colored whereas the background will be dark for the emission spectrum of atom. After understanding about the emission spectrum, now you can start questioning. What is absorption spectrum then? How we can come to know that which radiations are absorbed? The spectrum obtained by absorbed radiations are the absorption spectrum. So how absorption spectrum can be produced is a question now. When light is made to fall on an atom which is unexcited, it absorbs certain radiations. Remaining radiations are transmitted. So these transmitted radiations are passed 
through the prism and they are detected by the photographic film or the detector in the absorption spectrum you have dark lines and colored background so you can tell that absorption spectrum is the photographic negative of emission spectrum if you record the absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum for a same sample whatever the lines are missing in the absorption spectrum those lines will be present in the emission spectrum i mean to tell the absorbed light which is identified in the absorption spectrum will be found as colored lines in the emission spectrum now the question is why do we need to study emission spectra of an atom so the answer is for identifying each individual of a human being that is we we have fingerprints using which we can identify people similarly for an atom its atomic spectra so each characteristic lines of atomic spectra is unique for an atom so atomic spectra is used to identify a chemical species using all these ideas niels bohr was the first to explain the general features of hydrogen atom its structure and its spectrum the postulates of bohr's model are he told that nucleus is at the center and electrons revolve around the nucleus in the circular paths around the nucleus and these paths are called as orbits or stationary states or it is also called as allowed energy states these orbits have fixed energy and radius energy of electron in each orbit is fixed nothing but energy of electron is quantized electron will move from lower stationary state to a higher stationary state when required amount of energy is absorbed by the electron and this process is termed as excitation similarly energy is emitted when electron moves from higher stationary state to a lower stationary state and this process is termed as de excitation of electron the energy change that do not take place in a continuous manner the frequency of radiation absorbed or emitted when the transition occurs between two stationary states that differ by certain amount of energy and it is denoted as delta e and the expression for delta e is given by nu is equal to delta e divided by h which is equal to e2 minus e1 divided by h and this particular expression is known as bohr's frequency rule in this expression nu is the frequency delta e is the difference in energy and h is planck's constant e2 is the energy of electron in the higher energy level e1 is the energy of electron in its lower energy level electron is moving in circular orbits we know anything that is under motion said to possess momentum similarly here the electron which is moving in circular orbit it possesses angular momentum the angular momentum of electron in a given stationary state is given by the expression m e into v into r is equal to n into h divided by 2 pi where m e is mass of the electron v is velocity of the electron and r is the radius of the circular orbit n is a constant which is a positive integer can take the values from 1 2 3 and so on thus an electron can move only in those orbits in which the angular momentum is integral multiple of h by 2 pi in other words i can tell that angular momentum is quantized therefore the electrons have 
only certain fixed orbits through which it can revolve around the nucleus. Bohr has given formulas to calculate the radius of shell, the total energy of electron in an orbit as well as the velocity of electrons. Bohr's formula to calculate radius of shell is given by r is equal to 0 0.529 n square divided by z. This will give us the radius of shell in terms of angstrom. Similarly, if we use r is equal to 52.9 into n square divided by z, we will get the radius in terms of picometer. Both this angstrom and picometer can be represented in the SI unit of the length. We have one angstrom is equal to 10 to the power minus 10 meter. One picometer is 10 to the power minus 12 meter. Whereas one nanometer is 10 to the power minus 9 meter. In both the formulas, n is the shell number and z is the atomic number. Remember that this formula is used only for single electron atom. Bohr's formula to calculate total energy of electron is given by total energy is equal to minus 13.6 z square divided by n square in terms of electron volt. Remember that one electron volt is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 joules. Also the total energy for in terms of joules per atom is given by minus 21.8 into 10 to the power minus 19 z square divided by n square will give us energy in terms of joules per an atom. Similarly, if we want to calculate total energy in terms of kilojoules per mole, we can calculate using the formula minus 1312 z square divided by n square kilojoules per mole. So using these three formulas we can calculate the total energy of electron. Total energy I mean here it is the sum of potential energy and the kinetic energy of the electron. The formula to calculate velocity of electron is given by V is equal to 2.18 into 10 to the power 6 z by n meter per second. As mentioned earlier, n is the number of shell and z is the atomic number for the given atom. All these formulas can be used only for a single electron atom. Stability of an atom is explained based on the energy of the electron. The energy of electron is given by E is equal to minus 13.6 z square divided by n square. Now if you look into this formula, you might wonder why this is negative charge. It is because as the shell number increases, means as the value of n increases, the energy 
will also increase. For example, if I consider hydrogen for the first shell means for n is equal to 1 value, energy is given by minus 13.6, the atomic number for hydrogen is 1 and the value of n is 1. So energy is minus 13.6 electron volt. As I increase the shell number, now if I take n is equal to 2, value of energy is given by minus 13.6 into 1 square divided by 2 square. And the value comes out to be minus 3.4 electron volt. So here we can see that as the shell number increases, energy of electron increases. So, if an electron is present at an infinite shell, then its energy is considered as zero. Because if you substitute the value of n as infinity in this expression, energy will become zero. So, I can tell that energy in the outermost orbit is more than that of the energy of electron which is present in the inside shell. Since this outermost shell has more energy, it becomes less stable and therefore it eagerly participates in any chemical reaction. Whereas if you consider an electron which is present in the innermost orbit, it is more stable, hence it do not participate eagerly in a chemical reaction. So this is how you can explain the stability of atom based on the energy of electron. On heating hydrogen gas, electrons present in different atoms of hydrogen jump to various higher levels. Later, they may return to lower energy levels. During the return of electrons, excess energy is emitted as radiations. Series of lines will be obtained, which is called as the line spectrum of hydrogen. Remember that the movement of one electron from one level to the other level is termed as transition. The hydrogen's line emission spectrum consists of several series of lines. There are five series of lines and these are named after their discoverers. So we have Lyman series, Balmer series, Passion series, Bracket series and Fun series. Scientist by name, Rydberg has given formula to calculate the wave length or the wave number for different lines of the line emission spectra. These five series of lines of hydrogen's line emission spectrum belong to the different regions of the electromagnetic radiation. The Rydberg's formula is given by 1 by lambda or wave number nu bar is equal to r into z square into 1 by n1 square minus 1 by n2 square where r is Redberg's constant given by 1.09667 per centimeter or 1.0 into 10 to the power 7 per meter. Z is the atomic number n1 and n2 are the different energy levels among which the electron is undergoing transition. For hydrogen atom, Rydberg's formula is written as nu bar is equal to r into 1 by n1 square minus 1 by n2 square. This is because the atomic number for hydrogen atom is 1. Now let us discuss each five series of hydrogen's line emission spectrum in detail. 
Lyman series for the line emission spectrum of hydrogen is obtained when electron undergoes transition from the levels 2, 3 and so on from the higher energy levels to a level of N1 value is 1. So the ground energy level for the Lyman series is 1. Substituting this in the Rydberg's formula, I can write nu bar is equal to R into 1 by 1 square minus 1 by N square in general. So here this one value is 2, 3 and so on. Lyman series is corresponding to the ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Similarly, the Rydberg's equation for Balmer series can be written as R into 1 by 2 square minus 1 by n2 square. Here n is 3, 4 and so on. These Balmer series of lines are obtained when the transition of electrons is taking place from level n2 that is 3, 4 and so on to a level of 2. And these series of lines correspond to the visible region of the spectrum. In the line emission spectrum of hydrogen, Balmer series of lines are the only one which is corresponding to the visible region. So this particular point is important to remember. In a similar way, when the transition is occurring from N2 is equal to 4, 5 and so on level to N1 is equal to 3 level, passion series of lines are obtained and this is corresponding to the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this can be written as nu bar is equal to r into 1 by 3 square minus 1 by n square. And young here is 4, 5 and so on. This particular line is corresponding to the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Similarly, the bracket series as well as fun series of the line emission spectrum of hydrogen. Let us write the Rydberg's equation for them. The Rydberg's equation for bracket series is written as nu bar is equal to r into 1 by 4 square minus 1 by n square. So the n value for this particular equation is 5, 6 and so on. And this particular series, the transition is also corresponding to the infrared region. For fun series, Rydberg equation is r into 1 by 5 square minus 1 by n square and n value for this particular expression is starting from 6, 7 and so on. Fun series is also corresponding to the infrared region. In this diagram here you can see the transitions corresponding to the Lyman series, Balmer series and Passion series. The longest transition that is for n2 is equal to infinity is called as the limiting line of the spectrum. This point is important to remember that the longest transition is corresponding to the limiting line. If I want to write a general expression in the Rydberg's equation for the limiting line, I can write it as r into 1 by n1 square. Since it is longest, this n2 value is taken as infinity. So, this value I should be writing it as infinity. So, the expression simplifies to r into 1 by n1 square which in general I can write it as n square. Now, this n, the 1, 2, 
3 like that. So it is 1 for Lyman series, 2 for Barmer series, 3 for Passion series and it continues like this. So this particular formula nu bar is equal to R into 1 by n square will give us the wavelength for limiting line wave number or wavelength for the limiting line the major limitation of Bohr's model was that it was applicable only for single electron species such as h plus he plus li2 plus be3 plus and it could not explain the Zeeman effect also Stark effect. Zeeman effect is the splitting of spectral lines in presence of magnetic field and Stark effect is splitting of spectral lines in the presence of electric field. Also Bohr's model could not explain the shape of molecules as well as geometry of the molecules. In order to overcome the limitations of Bohr's model, several attempts were made to develop a general model for the atoms. The two important developments that led to the formulation of a general model were the dual behavior of matter, second is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Before moving to the study of general model that was developed based on dual behavior of matter and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, let us try to understand what are these principles about. After studying Bohr's model, we came to know that Bohr's model was built only based on the particle nature of electron. De Broglie, a French physicist, he told that electrons also has wave properties. He told every microscopic particles have both wave nature and particle nature. Dual nature of matter means matter can behave like a particle, it can also behave like a wave. According to de Broglie, wavelength is inversely proportional to the momentum of the particle and he gave the relation lambda is equal to h by mv. This m into v is nothing but it is equal to momentum of the particle and therefore wavelength lambda is equal to h divided by p where h is Planck's constant, p is momentum of the particle. From this relation, we can tell that as the wave nature decreases, the particle nature increases. And the wave nature for macroscopic particles is very very negligible when it is compared with respect to the wave nature of microscopic particles. The expression lambda is equal to h by mv which is equal to h by p is known as de Broglie wave equation. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to determine simultaneously the exact position and the exact momentum or velocity of an electron. And the mathematical representation of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is given by delta x into delta p which is greater than or equal to h by 4 pi. Same expression can be written as delta x into delta m v x greater than or equal to h by 4 pi. Just by rearranging the same expression, it can be written as delta x into delta v x which is greater than or equal to h by 4 pi m, where delta x represents the uncertainty in position and delta p x represents uncertainty in the momentum of the particle. If the position of electron is known with high degree of accuracy, its momentum cannot be predicted. Or if the momentum is known with high degree of accuracy, its position cannot be determined accurately. So this is what is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. To observe an electron, we can use light or electromagnetic radiation having wavelength smaller than the dimensions of electron. The photons of light will have high momentum which changes the energy of electrons by the collision. 
this collisions will change the velocity of electrons and we can get very little information about the velocity of the electron after the collision. But the position of electron can be identified. But this experiment in total it does not give a very accurate information about the momentum though we can identify the position of electron. Thus the results of the experiment tend to be incomplete. So, what was the outcome of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? That it rules out the existence of definite paths or trajectories for electrons and other similar particles. The trajectory of an object is determined by its position and by the velocity as well as other forces which are acting on that particular object. If we know the position velocity of the object we can fix it trajectory. Similarly for the electron if we can determine its position as well as velocity only then we can fix a particular trajectory for an electron. Whereas with respect to electron it's not possible for us to identify its position and velocity simultaneously. So, according to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, we cannot fix a particular path or trajectory for an electron which is revolving around the nucleus. The effect of Heisenberg uncertainty principle is significant only for the motion of microscopic objects and is negligible for the motion of macroscopic objects. So, with these limitations, Bohr's model could not be used for other atoms than hydrogen and hydrogen like atoms. Motion of all the macroscopic objects such as a falling stone, orbiting planet etc which have the particle behavior is described by classical mechanics which is based on the Newton's laws. It fails when applied to the microscopic objects like electrons, atoms and molecules etc. The failure of classical mechanics is because it ignores the concept of dual behavior of matter and uncertainty principle especially for the subatomic particles. The branch of science that takes into account the two behaviors, the dual behavior of matter and the uncertainty principle is the quantum mechanics. I can tell quantum mechanics is a theoretical science that deals with the study of the motion of the microscopic objects that have both the observable wave like properties and particle like properties. Now we get a question, can we apply quantum mechanics to macroscopic particles? Yes, of course, we can apply quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics when it is applied to the macroscopic objects, the results obtained are same as that of the application of classical mechanics for the macroscopic objects. Quantum mechanics was developed independently by Werner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrodinger. A mathematical equation that explains the behavior of electron is termed as Schrodinger wave equation. By solving the Schrodinger wave equation, we get a wave function and energy of electron. The wave function psi in the Schrodinger wave equation represents atomic orbital. What are orbitals? Orbitals are the 3D space around the nucleus where there is a maximum probability of finding an electron. A large number of orbitals are possible in an atom. These orbitals can be distinguished by their size, shape and orientation. An orbital is smaller size. It means that there is more chance of finding electron near the nucleus. 
if an orbital is of bigger size the probability of finding electron would be much lesser or it is much away from the nucleus similarly shape and orientation it means that there is more probability of finding the electron along a particular direction than along some other directions atomic orbitals are identified or differentiated by knowing their quantum numbers what are these quantum numbers we will discuss about the quantum numbers in a while where do i live i can tell the location where i live just by telling you my address similarly where an electron is present around the nucleus is told by quantum numbers in simple i can tell quantum numbers give address of an electron around a nucleus there are four different quantum numbers principal quantum number which is represented by small letter english alphabet n azimuthal quantum number represented by l magnetic quantum number represented by ml fourth is spin quantum number represented by ms in order to tell my location i need to tell you in which state i am living which district do i belong to under the district i should be specifying which particular taluk or the colony i am living similarly principal quantum number that represents shells where the electrons are present that is similar to that of the states according to our address azimuthal quantum numbers can be taken similar to that of districts for an electron it represents subshells and the magnetic quantum number represents orbitals of the electron which can be compared very similar to the taluks or colonies when we consider the address of our living principal quantum number is represented by n n is a positive integer with the value of n is equal to 1 2 3 so on principal quantum number determines the size and energy of the orbital it identifies the shell to which an electron belongs the number of orbitals in a particular shell is given by n square n is equal to 1 represents k shell similarly n is equal to 2 represents l shell n is equal to 3 represents m shell and n is equal to 4 represents n shell and so on azimuthal quantum number is represented by l it is also known as orbital angular momentum quantum number or subsidiary quantum number it tells us about the subshells it defines the three dimensional shape of an orbital for a given value of n l varies from 0 to n minus 1 that is for a given value of n the possible values of l are 0 1 2 so on till n minus 1 for example when n is equal to 1 the value of l is only 0 for n is equal to 2 the possible values of l can be 0 and 1 similarly for n is equal to 3 the possible values of l are 0 1 and 2 this continues in a similar manner the number of subshells in a principal shell is equal to the value of n for n is equal to 1 there is only one subshell which corresponds to l is equal to 0 for n is equal to 2 there are two subshells l is equal to 0 and 1 l is equal to 0 represents s subshell l is equal to 1 represents p subshell l is equal to 2 is d subshell and l is equal to 3 represents f subshell and so on the magnetic quantum number is represented by ml it tells about the orientation of the orbital ml can have values from minus l to plus l the total of 2l plus 1 values are possible for l is equal to 0 ml is equal to 0 means only one orbital is present in s subshell for l is equal to 1 ml is minus 1 0 plus 
tells that three orbitals is present in P subshell that is Px, Py and Pz. Similarly, for L is equal to 2, ML is minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. Five orbitals in D subshell that is dxy, dyz, dzx, dx square minus y square and dz square. It's important to remember that each orbital can accommodate maximum of only two electrons. To sum up, S subshell has one orbital, P subshell has three orbitals, D subshell has five orbitals, F subshell has seven orbitals, G subshell has nine orbitals, H subshell has eleven orbitals. Spin quantum number is represented by ms. Just now I have told that each orbital can accommodate two electrons. These two electrons have two types of motion. One is rotation about the nucleus. Second, rotation about its own axis. For example, you can consider the rotation of earth around the sun. And earth rotates around its own axis. Similarly, the electrons here. If one electron is rotating in clockwise direction, the other will be rotating in anti-clockwise direction. The two orientations of electrons is one is upspin and the other is downspin. The electron with upspin has ms value of plus 1 by 2 and an electron with low spin will have the value of ms as minus 1 by 2. It's important to note that two electrons present in an orbital can have same values for n, l and ml but their spin quantum number is different. The four different quantum numbers can be summarized using this particular table. Now let us summarize the different quantum numbers. Here we shall list the different shells, the corresponding value of principal quantum number and the value of L corresponding to the azimuthal quantum number. L can have values from 0 to n minus 1. Also we shall list magnetic quantum number which varies from minus L to plus L. We shall also write the subshell notation corresponding to the different quantum numbers. Also, we shall write the total number of electrons that is possible for each shell. So, the total number of electrons is given by 2n square. To begin with, we will start with k shell. The corresponding principal quantum number is 1 and the azimuthal quantum number can take values from 0 to n minus 1. So, the L value is 0. The corresponding ML value will be 0. So, the subshell notation here is yes and it is corresponding to the principal quantum number 1. So, it is 1s. Coming to the total number of electrons, it is given by 2n square and the n value is 1 here. So, 2 into 1 square. So, total number of electrons is 2. L shell corresponding n value is 2. So, the L can take values 0 and 1 corresponding ML value is 0 plus 1 0 and minus 1. So, corresponding to the ML value 0 the notation is yes and it is corresponding to the shell 2 L shell so it is 2s and the ml values corresponding to plus 1 0 minus 1 is represented as 2p. The total number of electrons it can be calculated as 2 into 2 square which is 2 into 4 it is equal to 8 electrons. M shell has the principal quantum number value as 3. So, the corresponding L values is 0, 1 and 2. ML values is written as 0, plus 1, 
0 minus 1 plus 2 comma plus 1 comma 0 minus 1 minus 2. The substitution notations corresponding to L is equal to 0. It is yes. Corresponding to L is equal to 1, it is P. And corresponding to L is equal to 3, it is D. So, since they belong to M shell, it is 3S, 3P and 3D. Calculation of total number of electrons, it is 2N square. N value is 3, it is 2 into 3 square. It is equal to 2 into 9 and total electrons is 18. Considering N shell, the value of N is 4. Corresponding L values are 0, 1, 2 and 3. ML values for 0 it is 0, for 1 it is plus 1, 0 minus 1. For 2 it is plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2. For 3 it is plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. L value corresponding to 0 is yes. For 1 it is P. For 3 it is D. And for F it is F. So these substitutions are belonging to the shell number 4. So it is 4S, 4P, 4D and 4F. Total number of electrons is given by 2N square. N is 4. So it is 2 into 4 square. It's 2 into 16 and the total number of electrons is 32. So this table summarizes the values for different quantum numbers belonging to K, L, M and N shell. And this is in the same way we can continue for the other shells also. I have already told you that orbitals have different shapes. Where the electrons are present in these orbitals? What is their position? Then what is the energy of electrons in each of these orbitals? These diagrams here represents the shape of different orbitals. So S subshell has one orbital that is the S orbital which is spherical in shape. So the shape of S orbital is spherical. Also we have three P orbitals Px which is oriented along the x direction and Py which is oriented along the y axis, Pz which is oriented along the z axis and all the p orbitals are dumbbell shaped. D orbitals are double dumbbell shaped. We have five different d orbitals dyz, dxy, dzx, dz square, dx square minus y square which are oriented along the respective directions. The size of all these orbitals increases with increase in the value of n. So we can write that 4s is greater in size than 3s which is greater in size than 2s in turn greater than 1s. Similarly for the p orbitals as the size of the orbital increases the value of energy also increases. So we can write 4p is greater than 3p which is greater than 2p. In the same way for d orbitals the size of the orbital increases as the value of n increases. Same way the order of energy is also varies. Also, we need to discuss an important term that is node. Node is a region where the probability of finding electron is 0. In case of S orbital, if you consider the region inside this sphere, any point if you consider, you have an equal probability of finding electrons at that particular point. In case of p orbitals, the probability of finding electrons is 0 at this point where the two lobes meet. Similarly, with respect to py orbital, at this point, the probability of finding electron is 0. 
and the same thing with respect to the d orbitals so here we have two different types of nodes the radial node and the angular nodes radial node is present between the s orbitals whereas the angular nodes are present between p orbitals and d orbitals the number of radial nodes can be calculated by n minus l minus 1 where n is the principal quantum number l is the azimuthal quantum number and the number of angular nodes is equal to the azimuthal quantum number so that is given by l angular nodes is equal to l and the number of radial nodes is n minus l minus 1 so total nodes is the sum of radial nodes and angular nodes it is nothing but l minus l minus 1 plus l so l and l gets cancelled the total number of nodes is equal to n minus 1 this is how you can calculate the total nodes angular nodes as well as radial nodes all these are important to remember the energy of the orbitals is determined by the principal quantum number for hydrogen atom increasing order of energy is written as 1s less than 2s which is equal to 2p less than 3s is equal to 3p which is equal to 3d less than 4s which is equal to 4p is equal to 4d equal to 4f and this is greater than the remaining energy levels here for n is equal to 2 the s and p orbitals has same energy for n is equal to 3 yes p d orbitals have same energy so these set of energy levels are called as degenerate for hydrogen atom 1 yes has lowest energy it is the most stable condition and therefore it is called as the ground state energy level whereas the other orbitals 2s 2p etc are termed as excited state for multi electron system the energy order is 1s less than 2s less than 2p less than 3s which is less than 3p less than 4s which is less than 3d this is the order for multi electron system it is told based on the value of n plus l if n plus 1 value is lower then the corresponding orbital should have 
lower energy. If a orbital has same number of n plus l value and the other orbital has similar n plus 1 value, then the one which is having lower value of n will have lower energy. We have studied that electrons are present in different orbitals and these orbitals have different energies. Now the question is how to fill up the electrons in these orbitals? Yes, we have certain principles to be followed while we fill electrons in the orbitals. Filling of electrons take place according to the Afbo principle which is based on the Pauli's exclusion principle, the Hund's rule of maximum multiplicity and the relative energies of the orbitals. Afbo principle states that in the ground state of the atom, the orbitals are filled in the order of their increasing energies. According to this principle, electron first occupy the lowest energy orbitals available and then enter into the higher energy orbitals only after the lower energy orbitals are filled. The order of filling electrons is 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 4f, 5d, 6p, 7s and so on. You can remember this order by using this particular figure. Starting from right top to the bottom left, the direction of the arrows gives the order of filling of orbitals. According to Pauli's exclusion principle, no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. This principle can also be stated as only two electrons may exist in the same orbitals and these electrons must have opposite spins. It means that the two electrons can have same value of three quantum numbers that is n, l and ml but must have opposite spin quantum number. The maximum number of electrons in a shell with the principal quantum number n is given by 2n square. Hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity states that pairing of electron in the orbitals belonging to the same subshell p, d or f do not take place until each orbital belonging to that subshell has got one electron each. That is, it is singly occupied. Using these basic principles discussed just now, we can easily write the electronic configurations of various atoms. The distribution of electrons into the orbitals of an atom is called as the electronic configuration. Electronic configuration is represented in two ways. S A P B D C notation. Second is the orbital diagram. In this notation, the subshell is represented by the respective letter symbols that is S, P, D, F, so on. And the number of electrons present in the subshell is depicted as superscripts like A, B, C, etc. The similar subshell represented for different shells is differentiated by writing the principal quantum number before the respective subshell. In the orbital diagram notation, each orbital of the subshell is represented by a box and electron is represented by an upward arrow for a positive spin or downward arrow for a negative spin. The orbital diagram notation represents all the four different quantum numbers for a particular electron. This is the advantage of orbital diagram notation over the SAPBDC notation. Now we shall write the electronic configurations of a few atoms 
using both the notations. Let us write the electronic configuration for a few elements. The first element that we shall consider is hydrogen. The symbol is H. So hydrogen atom has one electron and this one electron enters to the lowest energy that is 1s. So one electron is entering to 1s orbital can be written as 1s1. In order to write the orbital diagram notation, let us consider the orbitals in the form of boxes. Let the first box represent 1s orbital. This is 2s. This is 2p. Three boxes represent px, py and pz orbitals. So since the hydrogen atom is having one electron, that electron will enter into the 1s atomic orbital. Now let us write the electronic configuration for helium. Helium is represented by He. It has two electrons and these two electrons will enter into 1s orbital. So two electrons can be written as 1s2. Writing the orbital diagram notation. The first electron will enter into the s orbital. One more electron will have the opposite spin that will also enter into the first s orbital. So the orbital notation for helium is represented like this. For lithium, representation is Li. The atomic number is 3, which means that it has 3 electrons. So the first two electrons will enter into the lowest energy, it is 2s, 1s2. And the next electron will enter into the 2s orbital, so it is 2s1. Representing the same in the orbital diagram notation. One electron enters into the 1s orbital. One more electron enters into 1s orbital with the opposite spin. Moving to the next level. It is 2s. One more electron will enter into the 2s orbital. Since one orbital can accommodate a maximum of two electron. The third electron of the lithium will go into the next orbital. So this 2s orbital can accommodate one more electron okay that will be in case of beryllium the symbol is be so the first notation we write it as 1s2 2s2 representing it in terms of orbital diagram one electron is entering the first s orbital one more electron is entering into the same orbital so two electrons are filled Next electron is going to the 2s orbital and one more electron is going to the 2s orbital. Now let us write it for boron with the atomic number 5. So the electronic configuration in SA PBDC notation is written as 1s2, 2s2 and one more electron will enter the p orbital that is it will go for px orbital. Filling the electrons into the orbital diagram, two electrons in the 1s orbital, two electrons in the 2s orbitals and the next electron will enter into the 2p orbital. Similarly for carbon, the atomic number is 6, it means it has 6 electrons. So we can write the electronic configuration as 1s2, 2s2 and 2p2. In terms of orbital diagram, First electron will enter into 1s orbital, the second electron with opposite spin also will enter into 1s orbital. Next two electrons will enter into 2p orbitals and the fifth electron is entering 2p orbital. Now where the sixth electron will go? It will not pair up here since px, py and pz atomic orbitals have the same energy. The next electron will enter into the py atomic orbital. And this filling is according to Hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity. Similarly for nitrogen, electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And in terms of orbital diagrams, 5th electron is entering 2p orbital, 6th electron is entering the py orbital 
and the next electron will enter into the pz atomic orbital once this level is reached for the next atom oxygen the electronic configuration is 1s2 2s2 and 2p4 now let us fill the electrons into the orbital diagram two electrons entering 1s orbital two electrons enters 2s orbital fifth electron enters px sixth electron py seventh electron enters pz orbital now since the p 2p orbitals are singly occupied each p orbital is singly occupied the next electron will pair with the one electron of the px atomic orbital in a similar way you can write the electronic configuration for rest of the elements the electronic configurations of most of the atoms follow the basic rules that is afbo principle pauli's exclusion principle and the hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity in certain elements like copper or chromium where the two subshells differ slightly in their energies an electron shifts from a subshell of lower energy to a subshell of higher energy only if the higher energy subshell is getting either completely filled or half filled the valence electronic configuration of chromium is therefore 3d5 4s1 and not 3d4 4s2 whereas the electronic configuration of copper is 3d10 4s1 and it is not the 3d9 4s2 this shift of electrons takes place due to the extra stability associated with the electronic configurations which are half filled or completely filled here by we complete the chapter on structure of atom if you haven't watched our previous video on some basic concepts of chemistry you can watch it by clicking on the i button thank you for watching stay connected keep learning take care bye bye we shall meet in our next video